In light of this, I will demonstrate three things. Uh, the right of God to hold humans to account. It, uh, it is fair to hold um, uh, human beings to account, i.e. human beings are, are, um, can be judged. And the justice of the recompense of hell. Now, the right of, of God to hold human beings to account. So why, you know, can God even hold us to account in the first place? Is this fair? Well, firstly, I want to expose an underlying bias behind this discussion. This bias comes from liberalism, which believes that man is totally free of any control, that man's purpose is to enjoy life and, and, and experience pleasures, and that man is the best arbiter of what is good for him, i.e. man is, is the decider of his own purpose and destiny. We need to challenge this underlying concept, because it would imply that God is an interfering interloper and that we have no need of. Therefore, his judgment and punishment of us would be unjust, since man would, in effect, be a separate God who exists as equals with God, Aoud Billah. And because it believes that man is deserving of pleasure, it abhors the concept of hell. This is why you'll probably never see many public debates discussing, discussing whether paradise is just. Where infinite pleasures for what finite deeds, is that just? But uh, God is not an interloper who exists on equal terms with us. He is an infinite creator and maintainer of everything that exists, including us. Reality as we observe it, the universe and even the animal world, are certainly not acting according to liberalism. Maybe they didn't get the memo. But uh, liberalism is philosophically contradictory, irrational and unwarranted by evidence of creation itself. So the purpose of the creation of man and free will is responsibility and duty, not autonomy and hedonism. God has a right to define our purpose, just like he defined our existence. If something creates other things for no reason, then this creator has no will and is just random. But if a creator possesses intentionality, i.e. will, then that which he creates um, um, possesses purpose. And this purpose constitutes the establishment of the relationship between us and the creator. We, therefore, are God's own creation and, and his property, of which he exercises the right of disposal, i.e. the right to do so, uh, with as he pleases. God has defined that he should be worshipped by us. This takes the form of recognising him as the infinite and unlimited being that initiated the heavens and the earth. He is thus the sole reference point for all our belief and action. And as Allah SWT says in the Quran, do you think that we created you in jest, without any purpose, and that you would not be brought back to us? So, is it fair now to hold human beings to account? For human beings to be fairly held accountable, there must be four conditions fulfilled, generally. The humans held accountable must be aware, to some extent, of the gravity of the actions that they are going to be undertaking. Two, the humans, the humans held accountable must be the origin of their choices, not something else. And three, the humans agreed to undertake the trial of fulfilling their purpose by consent, although this is not absolutely necessary. And four, uh, mi mitigating circumstances should be taken into consideration. So um, God is not a robot which is going to just uh, uh, punish you or judge you according to a fixed criteria. He has, uh, he'll take your individual circumstances into consideration. And of course Allah SWT says in the Quran, Allah does not charge a soul beyond its capacity. So first, humans held accountable must be aware to some extent of the gravity of the actions they, they take. No one will be punished without them being reminded, forewarned, and given chances to accept the truth. The people being sent to hell will be asked, according to the Quran, that did not messengers come to you from amongst yourselves, reciting to you the signs of your Lord, and warning you against the encounter of this day. They shall say, yes indeed. And then it goes on to say, how evil is the lodging of those who are proud. So they rejected this. So basically, if you haven't received the message, then it's not your fault, right? You have to wait for the message to come to you or you to encounter this message by some um, way, shape or form. So that's fair. The humans held accountable must be the origin of their choices. Now this, this goes with determinism now, can I have some fun with this? In order for humans to be accountable, the actions they uh, make must have free will to make choices. Free will is disputed by materialist neuroscientists who portray humans as robots acting automatically. However, experimental results do not actually show that. We'll get into that a bit, bit later. But saying there's a consensus of material, materialist neuroscientists uh, and saying that this, you know, look, they believe in you know, materialism, it's a fact now, it's pretty much like me going to the Vatican and saying that there's a consensus of priests that Catholicism is true. And hence, that must mean it's a fact which I have to accept. 
Uh, no, these people are just subject to bias. For example, um, the steady state theory, where the universe was, was deemed to be eternal and never changing. And the famous atheist scientist Fred Hoyle rejected George Limas, who was a, a Catholic priest, ironically, uh, the Big Bang theory, and he called it the Big Bang theory, because he thought that by accepting the Big Bang theory, you'd introduce the need for a creator. And so he actually opposed it, and for a great long while he tried to um, prove the steady state theory until evidence just overwhelmed them, and then they all accepted it. But the majority of scientists at that time believed that the steady state theory was correct. Now, the experiments which he's referring to, and there's a whole, a whole bunch of them, um, they do show that the subconscious is responsible for initiating uh, impulses to act in humans. But this does not deny accountability of free will. The Quran talks about, uh, about uh, agreeing to an impulse suggested by the nafs. These new claims that the subconscious has a powerful effect on our behavior is old hat to Islam. We don't call it subconscious, we call it nafs. And of course, in, uh, in the Quran, Allah Quranah says, and so the nafs of Qabil, referring to Qabil, encouraged him and made it fair seeming to him the murder of his brother, and he murdered him and became one of the losers. So you had Qabil, who was basically being incited to action by his nuts, but surely the nuts is also part of your, your brain, right? So it's not two people, but it's showing that there's, there's the will of us, the soul of the will of us, and then there's the nuts, and the nuts initiates. Look how the nuts initiated the proposition for Kabil to murder his brother. Uh, Kabil did not come up with that idea uh, initially. It was, i.e., his desires initiated it. And again, preeminent pre neuroscientist Benjamin Leibe, who started the entire... Um, enterprise of experiments mm. on free will in the first place demonstrated by experiment that the human conscious possesses a minimum of 150 milliseconds to veto any impulse origin originating from the subconscious. So your subconscious basically initiates a you know, desire and your, your conscious can veto it, can stop it and choose a different action. You see, so this, this veto gives us a moral responsibility. You can't say, oh, my, oh, I felt like doing it, so I did it. No, you could have stopped yourself from doing it. And Benjamin Leibe, the person who came up with the whole bunch of experiments in the first place to look at uh, um, materialism or determinism and, uh, and free will, uh, himself is saying this, and it's demonstrated by his uh, um, experiments. And I can, I'm going to quote a few more, but time's limited. Um, the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said that Allah has forgiven my Ummah that which is whispered to them and which crosses their minds so long as they do not act upon it or speak it. So what is that? That's, that's veto, right? That's, you're only punished if you don't veto your desires and you follow your desires. And again, the ayahs of the Quran are numerous on this and the hadiths I just selected two. So, um, it's like, to give you an, ex an example of how the mind works, you, it's like being in a company, the workers, or, um, your subordinates produce the proposal, the analysts make the calculations, but in the end, it is the director which decides which proposal to pick. That is, in essence, what these neuroscientists have been saying who are not biased by a certain materialistic bent. Now, um, humans, the third point, humans um, agree to undertake the moral trust of fulfilling their purpose. Before creation, uh, of the, uh, before we were put into creation, we were asked by God, do we want to accept um, this, this uh, moral responsibility. The heavens and the earth, all, all inanimate objects which were given the capacity to understand, shirked away from it. But human beings accepted. So, if we accepted it, then you know, we, can't, uh, be, we can't blame other, other, situ other people, other things for our predicament. We did accept this upon us. And, a, and uh, Surah 33, 72 says this. There also is mitigating circumstances that should be taken into consideration for human beings to be fairly held accountable. If humans are prone to following their environment and circumstances, then is the afterlife fair? Well, the human propensity to be swayed by environment and conditioning is mitigated by some, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which he weights our good deeds by multiples of ten, and our bad deeds only weighted one. And also, and again, Surah 6, Ayah 160 gives you that. God will show 99 times more mercy on a, to us on the Day of Judgment than all the mercy that has ever existed in the entire universe. And, of course, He will forgive whole swathes of our sins just based on a few good deeds that we've done, or, or even a few moderate deeds that we did consistently. And I'll, I'll quote the eye on this. Those who believe and work righteous deeds, from them shall we blot out all evil that may be in them, 
and we shall reward them according to the best of their deeds. And furthermore, if that wasn't enough, in Allah's mercy, He has sent down to us a revealed law system to create an environment that limit public temptation to commit evil and establish socially reinforced values and ethics to aid psychological maturity. This is why Muhammad وسلم, who brought the revealed guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is called a mercy to mankind. So instead of so in order to help us from these temptations which might um, affect us the, we, we, and from our environment, we're going to change our environment to prevent these temptations in public. So in conclusion, it is just that humans should be held accountable for their intentional actions. Now the final part, the justice of the recompense of hell. Let us first ask the question, what do we mean by justice? Justice is giving to someone what they deserve based upon what they are or what they have done, i.e. their intrinsic value or the value of the actions they have done. For example, in the human world, a person that works hard in the job deserves payment. And a baby is a vulnerable human being that intrinsically deserves care and sustenance. So justice must involve giving to them what is deserved. Now, why is there pleasure and pain in the afterlife? Well, it's for the same reason there's pleasure and pain in this life. Pleasure and pain is experienced by living, created beings as motivations and consequences. We need feelings to move us, and we need feelings to reward us for fulfilling our purpose. For example, like contentment after sexual reproduction, or to warn us, i.e. stop us putting our hand into the fire, or as suffering uh, 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 to remind us and absolve us. The necessity of their existence emanates from our created purpose. So pain and pleasure emanates from our created purpose. Thus, in the afterlife, we will be accounted for our adherence to our purpose using the only thing we can experience. These two sensations, pain and pleasure. This leads us to the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the creation called hell. It is a recompense for bad actions and, and is a residence for those who intrinsically deserve it. Let us first look at hell as a recompense for bad actions. Hell will be used to settle the balance of bad deeds for unrepentant and thus unforgiven sinners who will then be granted paradise. And there is a hadith, a very beautiful hadith, where um, there, there will be intercession of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who will find anyone in hell that even has an atom's weight of belief, or an atom's weight of belief, and they will be taken out of hell. So this is a, a, a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you did bad deeds and you're in hell, you will be taken out of it at some point. But people do not have a problem with this view of hell. However, they claim hell produces an infinite punishment for finite actions. But hell is everlasting, not infinite in existence, nor does it punish to an infinite degree of pain, even at the lowest levels of hell. What I mean by this is everlasting is not infinite. We, our souls are everlasting, but we're not infinite. No one's going to say our soul is infinite. So hell is not infinite, and nor is the, the degree of pain you experience infinite. It's finite. It's always going to be finite, but it's going to be everlasting. This is something different now. There is also, I want to also give a, a difference between action and sin. Sin is the value of intentions behind the action, not the action itself. So, for example, a doctor using a knife to cut you open for an operation is not a bad thing, but uh, one of these, uh, a, a rioter on the street that stabs you, for example, is a bad thing. So, uh, sin can cause a greater evil than merely the time it took or the effort it took to commit it. So, for example, I could inject someone with a very strong poison and kill them in 10 seconds. But clearly, my act would not deserve only 10 seconds of punishment or a gentle squeeze with a thumb. Because the significance of my action is much greater than that action. And we accept this just intuitively and rationally, so, I, so this is not a problem. So the moral value must depend on the magnitude of the significance of the intention, intentional action. Rejecting the rights of someone has a negative value equal to the degree the right was offended against and the gravity of that right. If I attempt to lock someone up in prison, I have, uh, I have um, impinged upon his right, or rather I've committed offence against his right. But if I kill that person, that's a greater offence against their right to life. As I have shown, God has the right to be worshipped alone because he is the infinite and unlimited creator. To intend to associate partners to God, which comes in many forms, is to attempt to claim a limitation against his power and being, as the existence of equals to him would constitute a limit to his power and existence. So tell me, what do you think is the gravity of denying God as the infinite being and derogating him to finitude? 
What is the magnitude between the finite and the infinite? The gravity of that action in the eyes of God is severe in the extreme. In fact, this crime is so severe that it merits from God an inexhaustible punishment against an unrepentant criminal. Anything less than perpetual punishment is an injustice to God's right. Some people ask, how can God punish unrepentant associators and rejectors forever? I ask, why should he not? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allah forgives not that partner should be set up with him. Less than that, he forgives to whomever he will. Whosoever associates with Allah, anything has indeed forged a mighty sin. Ithim azim. The word azim, mighty sin. Which is interesting because one of Allah's names is al azim the mighty. So this is how, how severe this sin is. First, the Quran confirms the gravity of, this, of, of the sin of shuk. This brings us to discuss the type of people um, hell is designed for. Hell is also a residence for people who intrinsically deserve it, I will argue. Purpose is the measure of our intrinsic worth. If we become intrinsically against our purpose by becoming a rejecter of God, such that it becomes the very nature of us, then, that can, then we can be called intrinsically evil. Such a person will now deserve to have their rights to fulfillment permanently rejected by means of frustration in the afterlife, or what we call pain. The rejection of God by these people is perpetual and without end, so why shouldn't their recompense also be? If you could but see what they, uh, what they made to stand before, when they're made to stand before the fire, they will say, oh, would that we could be returned to life on earth and not deny the signs of our Lord and be among the believers. But what they concealed before has now appealed to them, and even if they were returned, they would return to what they were forbidden. Indeed, they are liars. Now, this is what Allah is saying in the Quran. That in, in hell, they say, yes, please, you know, we, if you take us out, we would worship you and we would be, you know, um, you know devotional followers of you. But they're saying it's because they're being punished. You know, they're not, they're not, rep um, um, they're not repentant of it. They're, they're saying this. And the true nature of their soul has become manifest. Life has now manifested. The true, their true colors have come out. And so if they had been returned to this world, they would again go on rejecting God, denying him to his face, so to speak. And so they are indeed liars. You may ask, why doesn't Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, just destroy them? But this would allow them to escape their sentence. It would be unjust of God to let a rejecter leave hell when they have not reformed themselves, or, or they cannot reform themselves. How many kuffar, uh, what we call rejectors of truth or God, would spend a limited duration, would gladly spend a limited duration of millions of years in hell just for the chance to do what they wanted in this life and defy God for the sake of their egos? This would be the afterlife equivalent of letting out of prison an unreformed murderer and rapist. Therefore, the punishment of hell is just. In summary, I believe that I have demonstrated rationally, with support from Islamic textual sources, the right of God to hold human beings to account is just, the holding of human beings to account is just, and the recompense of hell is just. And Allah SWT says in the Quran, And fear the day when ye shall be brought back to God. Then shall every soul be paid for what it earned, and none shall be dealt with unjustly. Thank you.